thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to talk at this uh, interesting conference. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there uh, in person. So uh, what I wanted to talk about was um, some, some new, uh, new work that we've been doing on uh, the mathematics of evolution, but from a rather uh, strange uh, perspective. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we, what we're going to try to look at in this talk is the, uh, the large scale structure of evolution and, and if we can learn anything from that. And as I'm going to show you, uh, we can learn something quite surprising, um, which uh, may inform some of the ways that we think about the interaction between uh, ecological processes and uh, evolution. So here is my, uh, my title and uh, funding. Uh, let's start off as all of this field uh, starts off in, the, in its recent years um, with, uh, with Carl Woese, who was my colleague at the University of Illinois for uh, many years. Um, this is Carl um, at his uh, desk in characteristic pose, November the 3rd, 1977. And he's on the front page of the New York Times uh, because as they put it, uh, scientists have discovered a form of life that predates high organisms. Actually, that headline, of course, uh, is not true. Uh, but what he had discovered uh, was something uh, very important, not just a new species or a new butterfly or something, but in fact, a, a whole uh, domain of life, the, the archaea. And not only did he uh, uh, find something uh, unexpected, but he also, uh, the way he found it was remarkable. Um, it, it was a discovery that was not made by accident. It, it was a, a result of a program search to uncover the evolution and history of life by looking at uh, molecular sequences. So this is what he found. This is a this is a uh, this is a, a tree of life of circa 1997 from Norm Pace. Uh, this shows uh, the three domains: the bacteria, uh, the archaea, the eukaryotes. Uh, there is you, and uh, at the root of this uh, phylogenetic tree is the, the what we call the last universal common ancestor or the last uh, universal common ancestor state, because we tend to think that it is uh, some sort of community of organisms. Um, and, and this is the point where you know, we can reach that by doing uh, molecular phylogeny, by comparing uh, genetic sequences. Uh, before that, uh, what happens, that is a whole other story, which I'm not going to be uh, talking about uh, today. But this route is basically generally agreed on to be around 3.8 uh, billion years ago, which is remarkable because the world is 4.6 billion years old. And so that means that life went from nothing to essentially the complexity of the modern cell in less than 1 billion years. And then after that, uh, there was a lot of diversification and so on, but very little fundamental changes, if you, if you will, to the basic cellular processes. Now, when we draw these uh, phylogenetic trees, and I've drawn, drawn them here again, uh, from my perspective, uh, as a physicist, they have a real fundamental significance. So let me just remind you that, of course, we can only see the edges, the existent uh, taxonomic units, uh, and then all the structure that you see inside, it tells you about the evolution. Uh, these are hypothetical taxonomic units, which are inferred by, uh, by relatedness of the of sequencing data from descendant species. And, and that's the whole field of molecular phylogeny. And so in some sense, these phylogenetic trees represent the trace of the evolutionary process. Okay, so, so I, as I'm a theoretical physicist by background, although I've been doing biology now for 20 years. Uh, and I tend to think of these things as what a physicist would call the call Feynman diagrams. And I'm not making this statement as a, as a fanciful uh, statement, uh, I'm making it as a, a, as a mathematical statement. And um, for those of you who don't know what Feynman diagrams are, uh, that won't impair your understanding of, of the rest of the talk. But some of you I know will, will, will have, know, have some exposure to modern statistical mechanics and, and will know what that means. So what I'm going to ask then is the question is, what can we learn about the large scale structure of the evolutionary process from the world lines of all the world species? So here's a, here's, a, here's a picture of phylogenetic trees. And as you can see, uh, the ones that we obtain today with, with um, you know, modern uh, sequencing and, and, and sampling of, of organisms and environments and so on, you see that these trees have a very uh, non-trivial structure. If I take a part of that tree and then uh, blow that part up, you can't really tell that that's any different from the original tree. So they, they look anecdotally uh, self-similar. And uh, what I want to talk about now for the next few minutes is a mathematical quantification of the way in which phylogenetic trees are self-similar. 
So there's two aspects that I'm going to talk about uh, today um, and, and that we've done in our work. And one aspect is the topological structure of phylogenetic trees, and the other is uh, the edge lengths. So uh, topology means uh, what aspects of the structure uh, aren't metric, in other words, are not changed uh, when you uh, change the length of these, of these edges of the tree, as, we, as we'll call them. We'll call these little blobs nodes. Um, so this is topology, it doesn't depend on, 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 on metric. Uh, on the other hand, uh, edge length, the size of these lengths of these, these trees, these clearly tell you something about the number of, of, of DNA mutations. So they are something about the, tell you something about the timescales in evolutionary processes. So here's how we're going to quantify the tree uh, topology. We're going to take a node, and then we're going to ask uh, if I look at how many uh, nodes are rooted at that particular node. So let me give you an example. So let's suppose I take this node here, is clearly itself, and, and it goes down to the, to, the, uh, to the current time. So that has just the number one associated with it. This node here is similar to that one, so it also has a one. This node here, has two nodes that descend from it, right, that are in the subtree, and, and itself, so its number is three. Same for this one over here, because this is a, a symmetric tree. And then if you go to this node over here, it has itself, plus the two subnodes that are uh, uh, rooted from it, and so its number is three plus three plus one, which is seven. So that's the quantity that I'm going to call A, if you like, the, the, the node number. Now there's another number, which I'm going to call C, which is the cumulative size or the summation of the A's from the subtree I. So let's look at this again. So here we have for these little nodes here, they have one and one, so, so because there's nothing there. This one here, well, we're going to, we're going to sum these, the subtrees. So what we have is its node, its subtree node number is three. These ones have subtree node number one, and so it's three plus one plus one that gives you five. Same thing over here. This node over here has uh, five plus five, which is uh, which is ten plus its own number seven, so you get seventeen. <coughs> so the, the, you get these two numbers C and you get A. They tell you something about uh, the tree. So far, you might just say, "Well, why bother to do that?" Well, the reason you bother to do that is that if I now look at the types of tree that you might get, you see a very interesting result. So it, let's suppose I have a tree which is completely symmetric. Every node bifurcates into two, every node bifurcates into two. This is two species coming off every single node here. Then you can work this out, and, and, and those of you who know what a fast Fourier transform is will not be surprised to know that this, the cumulative number as a function of A, uh, C of A, uh, scales asymptotically for large A as A log A, and you can, you can prove that mathematically. If you look over here at what is the most unbalanced tree that you can make, where at every juncture, one of the nodes uh, does not branch, just goes down to the present time, the other node uh, goes down to some time and then it, it branches and so on and so forth as shown here. What you can show is that if I plot this relation, what happens is that C goes as A squared. So you've got these two different laws, a completely unbalanced law, uh, a tree going as A squared and a completely balanced tree going as A log A. So now you can start to learn something about the balance uh, of these phylogenetic trees by looking at how C depends upon A. And if you take real uh, phylogenetic trees, uh, as we did in 2012, and then we realized that we've been scooped by a couple of years by this group, by Harada et al. <laughs> so here are their data. And uh, you can see C as a function of A over quite a few decades, uh, scales as a power law, and that power law goes as a goes as 1.44. I don't really believe the error bars on this, but anyway, it's 1.4, 1.5, something like that. Okay, so that's that's interesting. So what does it mean? So I'm going to discuss what, what that means. Before I do that, I want to just show you that this, this isn't the only example. Um, I'm going to tell you about how one can look at the edge length distributions. And now that I'm telling you about work that was done a few years ago by uh, James O'Dwyer, also at the University of Illinois, uh, looking at uh, microbial uh, communities. And so what you do, and this is a bit more complicated, so you're not going to get it first time perhaps, but what you do is you look at a, a clade uh, that has um, K tips. 
and then you look at the edge length between uh, the node and the and the branching point, and then you sum up all the uh, the, the lengths of the tips. So this is shown uh, here. So let's have a let me quickly walk you through this. And if you get confused, uh, don't worry; uh, it won't affect your understanding of the rest of the talk. So so let's suppose we say I want to look at um, the the clades with one tip. Well, the clade the clades with uh, clades with one tip are all of these uh, all of these numbers. Uh, here, so this, all of these don't really go down, they have just one tip. So the length of these, this length is 10, this is 4, 4, 2, 2, 3, so that number is 25. So now let's have a look at the clades that have two tips. So, uh, so, so, so there's this one and uh, this one, and, uh, and so you get the numbers 2 plus 1, you get 3. If I go to the nodes with 3, you get 4, and so on and so forth, and you can work these through. So if you then take a look at uh, the, the, this edge length distribution, uh, what you can show is uh, if I assume that the phylogenetic tree as a model is just a, a yield process, just a randomly branching structure, which of course we know it can't possibly be, but if you believe that, you can show that this S of K scales as K to the minus two, uh, and that would correspond to a, a neutral model with an exponentially growing community. If on the other hand, as you know that there are common ancestors, and so you get what's known as coalescence, uh, then you can show that S of K goes as K to the minus one. And uh, when you look at uh, various uh, microbial communities and, and you, uh, you construct these trees and you work out the edge length distribution, what you find is it's, it's a power law somewhere, excuse me, somewhere between uh, these two limits. And, and again, um, maybe not, not quite as well established as the other power laws, but still very clearly um, you know, some, something, something scheming. So these topological measures, in particular in the edge length distribution, capture something about the large scale uh, structure of evolution. And now I'm going to tell you uh, uh, how that happens. So the first question we're going to ask is where can these non-trivial power laws come from? And the second question we're going to ask is what do they tell us about living systems? So in order to tell you about the non-trivial power laws, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about uh, some things that happen in physics, uh, because um, these, these power laws have been well observed in, in physical phenomena, and I want to explain to you why. Again, you don't need to know much about physics, I'll tell you everything you need to know. So we're going to talk about magnetic materials. So magnetic materials are magnet, uh, which has a magnetization, which you can think of as, as the number of spins that point in one direction, uh, minus the number of spins that point in another direction. And when all the spins in a magnet all point uh, in the same direction, the thing is magnetized. So what happens is below some critical temperature, um, the, the spins uh, tend to uh, line up. Uh, and as you go to higher temperatures, thermal fluctuations randomize the spins and you don't get any order. Excuse me. And uh, at this critical temperature here, um, what happens is the order first sets in. And if I were to ask you the shape of this curve, you might probably say, well, it's probably a parabola or something like that. But in fact, it turns out to be something non-analytic. The magnetization goes like T minus TC uh, to, to the power beta, where beta is about 0.326 or something like that. That's true if there's no external magnetic field as you're, and, you're, and you're close to the critical temperature. If on the other hand, you sit on the critical temperature and then you ask, how does the magnetization of magnets depend on whether or not you apply an external field? Now you all learned Curie's law on your mother's knee and you will know that as I apply an external magnetic field to a magnet, I will point some of the spins in the direction of the magnetic field. And so the number of spins that point in the direction of the magnetic field will be proportional to the magnetic field itself. That's called linear response theory in, in physics. But that breaks down uh, at the critical point. And in fact, the number of spins that point up minus the number that point down, the magnetization, scales as h to some weird power. And it turns out that both of these stylized facts can be combined into one a similarity formula, which I'm not going to derive, which is, is shown over here. And, the, uh, and, and what happens is when you plot the magnetization from different magnets and different temperatures and different external magnetic fields against the temperature scaled in a way that that formula showed you. These are data from five 
different magnetic materials and different temperatures and different fields, they all collapse onto one uh, universal curve. All the data fall onto one curve, and the solid line through here is a prediction from the theory of uh, phase transition to the renormalization group theory. So this is quite remarkable because you're seeing something universal. All these data fall on the same curve, regardless of what material it is. And so what we are seeing then is that a model of magnets, uh, the, the model that was used in the calculation, the renormalization group calculation, uh, gives you a precise agreement with experiment. Now, why that's so surprising to physicists and why the person who, who solved this mystery won the Nobel Prize is that it's not actually true that it's a model that gives a precise prediction in agreement with experiment. It's a model of a model of a model of a model of a model. Of a model. Because when we think about what a magnet is, we start at the lowest level of description of quantum chemistry, then there's the electronic structure, there's quantum mechanics, then we can say, well, quantum mechanics is too hard, so we'll have a classical theory, then we can make a coarse grain theory, and then there's Landau theory of phase transitions. All of these steps that go from the microscopic physics down up to the thermodynamics are all non-systematic approximations. And yet, even though each of these approximations would make a mathematician laugh, uh, the result is exact. And it's, it, it's, in, it's absolutely incredible and we understand it very well. But the point is that even if you make brutal simplifications in your modeling of a process, you can still uh, understand these data collapses and other phenomena that happen in your phase transitions and, and to predict them precisely. Now, where they come from in physics is the, is, the, is, is, the, is the following surprising fact, which is called scale interference. So this is a quantity which measures correlations at different length scales. I'm not going to go through how it's precisely defined. This is calculated as a function of wave number that you, you do a scattering experiment at, uh, at the critical temperature. And if, if you look, uh, if you look, um, on, you know, in a textbook, you'll see that this number scales as the wave number to the power minus two plus eta, where eta is called an anomalous exponent. Now, why this is uh, is surprising, this uh, the scaling law here, is that the correlation function has units of length squared. Wave number has units of inverse length. So this quantity here clearly does not have units of length squared. It has units of length to the two minus eta power. So what that means is that there has to be something to restore dimensional analysis. And the thing that restores dimensional analysis is the lattice spacing raised to the power eta in here. So what's happening then is that you have scale interference. And we call it scale interference because this law is supposed to be true for small values of k, which means looking at the thermodynamic size of the system, the large scales. And yet somehow what is happening is that the system, even though you're looking at it on very large scales, still remembers the presence of the lattice spacing. And so if I were to tell you that if I were to try to calculate something about you know, the sound waves and the gas or something like this, something very macroscopic, you still had to worry about the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the radius of the proton or something ridiculous like that. You just say it can't possibly matter. But in phase transitions, uh, these things do matter and scales that shouldn't be important turn out to be important. So the bottom line is systems remember the small scale details, even though the correlation length is very large. And this is something that only happens uh, at, at phase transitions. So now the question is, is there scale interference in evolution? And how could such scaling laws uh, arise? Well, here's the evolution process. And now let's talk about what we're really looking at when we look at a phylogenetic tree. So these branching events are, are supposedly speciation events, but speciation is a very complicated process. And each of these nodes is where um, ecology happens. Speciation process happens through all sorts of interactions between organisms, between the environment, between the, 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 the physical, uh, uh, geophysical effects, uh, all, of, all of these things, the adaptation and so on. People well understand that. And so by the time that you get to a new species where it has to spread out uh, and, you can, and you can observe it, um, you, uh, you, you have, that has happened as a result of ecological processes. So let's have a look then at the ecological processes. Well, the time scales we're interested in are large time scales. These are evolutionary time scales. Ecological processes happen on much shorter time scales compared to the large scale evolutionary time scales. So when we draw a phylogenetic tree, we assume that the ecological time scale 
is much shorter than the evolutionary time scale, and we set this number equal to zero. Now we know that that can't really be true because there could be a mechanism for a scale interference. And that is because we know that there's a whole series of uh, mechanisms by which uh, the environment uh, selects uh, on the population that you have, the population structure through its activity, say its met metabolism and so on, uh, creates new biochemical niches in the environment or, or other physical niches. And so there's an interplay between the environment and the population structure of the organisms that live on it. And so the evolutionary trajectory of an entire ecosystem can be affected by these sort of rapid evolution processes uh, as, as they become to be known over the last 20 years. And so the fact that there is a feedback between evolution and ecology, at least in principle, suggests that this timescale separation idea uh, may not be valid in evolution. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, to very quickly go through um, how one can think about ecological interactions from the point of view of uh, particles and, and fields. So over here, I've drawn uh, some typical uh, ecological interactions. So I'm, I've chosen to do predator and prey. So A means a predator, B means a prey, E means the food. And if I were to describe a predator-prey ecosystem stochastically, I would write down these various processes. For example, this is a process that says uh, a prey eats some food and then it gets enough energy to make a uh, baby prey. So, so you can now end up with two prey. Here's an interaction that says a predator runs into some prey, eats it, gets some energy from that, and then is able to reproduce and make two prey. Uh, sorry, make two predators. So this, that's what these symbols mean. And these can be represented by Feynman diagrams by, by if one wants to make a spatial temporal uh, space-time description of, uh, of this uh, ecosystem uh, as, as I do and as other people do in their work. So in, in, uh, in, uh, in quantum field theory, in quantum chromodynamics, for example, these are complicated uh, diagrams that represent quarks and gluons interacting. When one writes down uh, models of population dynamics uh, using uh, statistical mechanics, uh, one finds that one uses the same mathematical tools that one uses in high energy physics. And these vertices here represent the processes that happen um, in ec ecology, niche invasion, range expansion, competitive exclusion, predation, and so on and so forth. And again, I'm not going to go through this quite technical literature. Now, th this idea was recognized long ago, uh, um, and Mark Feldman, who I've mentioned previously, is one of the people involved in this, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in, in the idea of niche construction, which I think goes back to Lewontsky. Namely, that if I look at uh, the, the normal equations for organisms, we think of the organisms evolving uh, on uh, a subject to their own interactions and also subjects to the environment. But we think of the environment as, as not involving the organisms at all, but just changing in its own way. And what niche construction says is what I just told you, um, that th there is a feedback between the organisms and the environment. And so you get uh, evolution as a collective behavior and exhibit A in that is, is of course the great oxygenation event where cyanobacteria uh, poisoned the world um, about 2.6 billion years ago with oxygen. And that led to the, uh, the evolution of aerobic organisms like us. So now I want to show you in the last five minutes, a mathematical model that uh, actually quantifies this. So we're going to talk about, we're going to make a very idealized picture of niche construction. And because it's idealized, I'm going to go back to what I told you at the beginning of the talk or earlier, a few minutes ago, namely that even though one makes very simplified crude models of a complicated physical process, uh, those, <coughs> those models can still give you precise predictions. So, <coughs> excuse me. So let's get into that. So I'm going to define a niche as being the relatedness between a species and its ecosystem. Niche construction is how uh, a species and its ecosystem mutually interact. The survival and diversification of a species depend on its niche, that's the ecological process, and the niche of a species is correlated with its ancestors, and that's how evolution uh, comes into this picture. So in this picture, then, the niche is the total available uh, growth space or the evolutionary degrees of freedom that organisms have. And organisms with a large niche value 
we're going to give them a number, has a, have a large number of ways in, in which they can adapt to the environment. So each node in these trees here has a niche number, a speciation rate, and then ends an extinction probability. So you can write down uh, very simple dynamical processes that describe the process of inheritance, the process of speciation, and the process of extinction. This process of speciation is the one I want to focus your attention on. So this is the this is the speciation rate, and it's going to depend upon the size of the of the niche. Of course, niches have to have a certain size if they they can't be you can't have a negative niche. So this number uh, basically has to uh, not really be defined in an effective way uh, when when the niche number uh, is is negative. Okay, so there's this model, uh, and now we can generate phylogenetic trees from this model, and we can compute the ratio of C over A, and we can look to see, do we get a power law? And what you can see here is that if I, if I assume that there are large fluctuations in the laws of inheritance, as the larger those fluctuations get, as I plot these curves, these curves approach this red line here, uh, which is uh, a power law scaling as, as, as 1.5 exponent. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. If I compute the cumulative edge length distribution that I showed you uh, for the microbial communities, uh, what you can see is that again, you get a power law here. Um, and, uh, and as I increase uh, sigma, you get a power law somewhere between uh, one and two. Don't worry about this. This is due to the undersampling of large trees. So what I've shown you is that this very simple niche model can reproduce the scaling laws that you see in real uh, data um, and with exponents very close to those uh, that are observed in real trees. So do we really have anomalous power or scaling in the same way that we do in statistical mechanics and critical phenomena? So uh, I'm going to show you that the answer is yes. And so the, the reason for the, the scaling law, the scale interference here, is, is this asymmetric law that I told you about. The speciation rate depends on the niche number in this way here. So of course, uh, for n greater than zero, it, it, the, the speciation rate depends on, uh, on increasingly on n. It doesn't matter if this law is n or n squared or something, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then it goes to a constant uh, when n is, uh, is, is, is negative in this model. Uh, this constant can be made equal to zero. And so the point though is that this n equals zero, this zero speciation, uh, the zero niche number um, is, a, is a kind of singularity because once you run out of niche space, then nothing else can happen after that. The evolutionary process cannot have any more branching. And so if you have larger and larger evolutionary fluctuations, inheritance fluctuations, you have a higher chance to reach this boundary and then get wiped out. It's an absorbing boundary. And so what is happening here is that that boundary is, 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 is causing the singularity. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the mathematical analysis for this, but I want to just show you the analog of the data collapse that I showed you earlier for magnets. So here you can see this ratio C over A uh, versus a scaling function. Again, I'm not going to go through the mathematics of this. And what you can see is the data from all these different uh, phylogenetic trees all collapse within the, the, these fluctuations into, a, into a, a, a universal tree, a universal function. Okay, so what have I told you? What I told you is that uh, we have uh, non-trivial power law scalings in, uh, in, in when we look at the large scale structure of evolution. And, uh, and that one way, I don't know any other way, but uh, I, I can't rule out the possibility that there's other ways to explain this. One way to understand these non-trivial uh, scaling laws is that it arises from the indelible uh, footprint of niche construction. And it's, uh, and in other words, the interplay between short timescale ecological processes and large timescale evolution processes. And then what does it tell us about living systems? Well, I didn't really say much about that because I don't really know. It tells us that evolution is more than just looking at uh, point mutations or horizontal gene transfer and so on and so forth. When we look just at, at the genomics, uh, we are looking at only a very pale shadow of the evolutionary process. Um, how can shadow be pale? Well, anyway, um, we're, we're looking at a, at a faint shadow of the evolutionary process. One really have to take into account the ecological dynamics that lead to genetic fixation, even when you're looking at timescales uh, of billion years. So uh, that's what I wanted to, to tell you about, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.